Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, uh, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop, which coincidentally happens to be my bookshop. Uh, today, our guest is Michael Spitzer, author of The Musical Human, A History of Life on Earth, which is kind of an interesting title because you wouldn't usually equate our entire lives with simply music. And it'll be published on April 13th by Bloomsbury. Michael is a musicologist and an accomplished pianist. He's a professor of music at the University of Liverpool. He, just li he lives just off of Penny Lane, which is quite musical in itself. Uh, his previous works include Metaphor and Musical Thought, Music as Philosophy, Adorno and Beethoven's Late Style and was also editor of Beethoven. <clears throat> the musical human reminds us that music is the soundtrack, if you will, of our life from before birth till perhaps the moment that we shed our mortal coils. But how is it our origin story? The fact that it's been over 150 million years since rhythm imbued us with a precursor of a sort of music, was it the fact that over 60 million years ago we hummed or thrummed our first melody? Or the fact that 40,000 years ago, we, Homo sapiens, created the first musical instrument, I guess a tool of sort. So today, today, as we all know, from our conscious beings to our subconscious, music fills our life. But has it actually defined what we are and how we comprehend that essence? And yet that crucial element of our essence, if it will, is oftentimes overlooked. So Michael tells us that story deductively from the global perspective and inductively from specifics outward, which is a great way to teach both the novice and master. So is music the most important thing we have ever done? Michael may say he thinks so. So let's ask him ourselves. Welcome, Michael, and thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Sam. So first, and this is again kind of off the wall, at the end of the book, you provide us a note on the type, which I always love, and I love Garamond. And then I thought, wait a minute, the type is kind of the soundtrack of the book. And I thought of it as kind of an analogy, or am I all wrong? Either way you answer will be informative to the reader. Well, thank you. Um, it's very hard to distill the message or the take home meaning of a very long book, but let me start with why I wrote it. I was inspired by, do you know uh, Yuval Harari's Sapiens? Yes. It's an extremely ambitious attempt. Well, it's a successful exercise in mapping our origin story. And what occurred to me, first of all, was where was the music? Um, and how would one go about it, um, writing an origin story of music given that Edison invents his phonograph only in 1877 and there's just no recordings before then? There's nothing analogous to the pigment on cave walls. Um, and also what inspires me was that music and allows you to go far deeper into time because um, animals are musical and just looking around you today at what birds are singing or humpback whales or indeed the pulse choruses of crickets of katydids and insects music was there millions of years before humans and in some ways sapia music is just a footnote to to nature's music when did you first realize that music was an integral part of your life i was born in a a middle-class Jewish family which hands on the great European culture of reading and respect for for, for the classics and for uh, Beethoven and Mozart um, and for me and it's a very personal experience it was my connection with other people and with with the cosmos and I, it was so delicious I knew I never want to do anything else apart from swim in this uh, medium of sound and I never left it I just carried on you know being a professor and a writer and a, and a pianist and what I want to do in the book is to pass on that love and a sense of encompassing relevance of music to to everybody academics are often frustrated because we, we just talk to each other professors write books for each other and yet the message we're telling is so burning and so universal how do we get it out there and having written several 
tomes of academic musicology, which nobody outside the academy ever reads. I was bursting to tell the story to as large an audience as possible. There isn't a scrap of music notation in my book, and I know that notation can be quite daunting for, for lay readers. And what has gratified me is that um, there is an enthusiasm for my book across the whole spectrum of readers, from experts like Daniel Levitin to my parents and to, you know, um, just completely ordinary readers out there. It's how it should be for music. The cool thing about the book is that, well, I had never heard Haydn's Surprise Symphony. And when I got to that note, I think, I literally kind of like leaped. I kind of, I don't know what the motion I made, but it did surprise the hell out of me. And you already told me it would. Um, but then the thing that you do is all of a sudden I'm reading about Ry Cooter, yes. who I've loved since 1968. And so it's the breadth of the book that allows the novice to really have access to it. You know, whether you're talking about Gangnam style, uh, which who knew that would be in the book, or whether you're talking about Mahler's Fifth people who may be familiar with one and not the other, or both allow themselves to finally go, oh, there's a juxtaposition between these two that really means they're kind of the same. And mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you don't often read a book that does that, that takes popular culture and mixes it with classical culture. I found that fascinating and also very helpful for me as a reader. I think I do that, I learned to do that when I migrated from an Ivy League institution called Durham or Durham, as you would say, University, which is like Oxford and Cambridge. And I spent 20 years of my life in a very, uh, you know, ivy clad, uh, clo cloistered, um, conservative university. And then 10 years ago, I went to Liverpool and that needs no introduction. And I was forced to grow up very, very quickly and embrace diversity. So the majority of my students um, we call them popsters, they're popular musicians. Many of them, albeit they're very fine musicians, can't read music notation. And you don't need to read music notation to be a fine musician. So I was, you know, educated to embrace a massive diversity of music. It's not just about Haydn or Mozart, it's about Vaikuda, it's about the other civilizations, India, China, the Islamic world, which are arguably, well, no, they are just, if not, uh, more important than the Western civilization. They got there earlier than the West. So China, which is one of the big stories of my book, was uh, a global, uh, a musical superpower 400 years BC. And what China invents boggles the mind. So let me tell you a story. Um, in 1978, the communists dug up a tomb uh, belonging to uh, ancient Chinese warlord called the Marquis Yi of Zen, who died in 433 BC. And what they found was staggering. They found 65 bronze bells. And what the bells show is that at that time, four centuries BC, Chinese acoustic science was infinitely superior to Western acoustics. And also the bells played chromatic scales or 12 semitone scales, as we call them. It took the West two more thousand years, two millennia, to reach the same conclusion as China. But what the Chinese bells show you is that there are different pathways. We in the West took one path, the way of pitch and writing notes down on paper. In China it's much more about colour, what musicians call timbre. It's a, a gong or a bell culture. So if you look at all those pictures of Confucius playing his zither, or what Chinese call his chin, under uh, apricot tree. Um, a, a zither is a kind of flat harp and it's m much more delicate. You, you often find the sage or the, or the philosopher playing his or her harp out in the open where the sound blends with the sounds of bamboo and wind rustling through, uh, through, through leaves. But there are um, 40 finger techniques of how to produce different colours on the chin. And compared to that, Western notation is so impoverished. We're fixated in the West with pitch, and there are only 12 pitches. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of possible colours, and the Chinese access that. So my story um, contextualises the West within these other, in some ways, more advanced musical civilizations. It's much more pluralistic.
Well, one of the things I did early on in the book was I, I, I thought to myself in a somewhat, I guess, plebeian way, what is music? So I went to Merriam-Webster and it defines music in part as the science or art of ordering tones or sounds in succession, in combination and in temporal relationships to produce a composition having unity and continuity. So I guess it has to be asked then, how do you differ with that definition? It's an impossible task to define music. How do you define music? That's what I thought. Um, one definition which actually fails is organized sound. Why is organized sound not sufficient? Well, um, a train has organized sound. Your fan heater has organized sound. What you need to add to organized sound is patterns of life. Patterns of life as in human emotions, human experiences, human gestures. When you mix that with uh, sound organization, then you get music of all kinds. You can't pin it down to a particular style of music. So if you compare Raikuda with an Afri or the West African drumming dance or with uh, a raga from Hindustani music, they're all completely different uh, languages, but underpinning them, a bit like a Chomsky in deep structure, you have this uh, um, essentially what I call organized sound with motivation, organized sound with emotion and gesture and patterns of life. Well, not to uh, stay with Rai Kuder too long, but the interesting thing you do with that, which which goes to this very concept, is the fact that you, Rai Kuder to me, would play the slide guitar and back from when I went to Woodstock, that's what I thought he did. And that was the first time I encountered slide guitar. And it was amazing to me. But then you talk about, which I love, like the Buena Vista Social Club, when he made a complete departure. And that was very interesting. And you, and you thought well enough of that to bring it up and to discuss it. Yes. I think what's marvelous about Raikuda's slide guitar technique, it's so evocative of the, of the human voice. Exactly. It's like so somebody speaking. And how does music do that? How does it express the, the human voice? Uh, there's a theory that the, the, the brain, which is respond the brain part, which is responsible for hearing music, it also um, is responsible for, for language. So it's the same brain module. And we learned music because we were already pre-programmed to understand language. Now, I, I have problems with that because music isn't a language. Music is, is an activity like dancing or jogging or running. It's much more embodied or visceral and language comes later. And one of the reasons why we, um, before my book, don't have a origin story of music is because it's been written by linguists, people like Jack and Dorf or um, indeed uh, uh, Stephen Pinker, who notoriously called music no more than auditory auditory cheesecake, delicious, huh. but delicious, but not evolutionary beneficial to us. So the story has been told by the wrong people, by language experts, by linguists like Pinker, Jackendorf, and therefore they neglect what is most front and center for music, which is contour, going up and down, or color, or rhythm, or gesture. These are much more fundamental to musical experience. And what music does, which language doesn't do, or indeed mathematics, you know, there's this, um, you know, uh, um, erroneous analogy between music and mathematics. It's actually wrong. But what music does, it connects people together, dancing or even working together, coordinating work through tapping in the same rhythm. It's a way of socializing. And that's how culture starts, by connecting people in ever wider circles. Why is it so evocative? Like smells, like smelling burning leaves and it bringing back feelings of memory, nostalgia, childhood. Or if you listen to Debussy, Afternoon of a Fawn, you see, how do you see what the title is telling you is in the music? How, what is it in your brain? And you talk about where it resides in your mind. What is it that allows you to see the scene that the music metaphorically says music is sticky memories and experiences stick to it oh um it's the honey they're playing my song phenomenon that a married couple will be reminiscing in the restaurant and when a melody or a song comes on they'll be oh yes 
we heard this 20 years ago when you first proposed to me. And the reason music does that is that it accesses the part of the brain called the amygdala, or even deeper, the reptile brain, which comes lower and before the neocortex, which processes um, syntax and expectations and knowledge. Um, and the brain is, is, you know, like a palimpsest, there's different levels. And I think music definitely immediately accesses the deepest parts of it. Well, I'll give you a list. These are songs that I, when I'm in the symphony, there's seven notes and then it's gone. But then afterwards it's all there, but the seven notes are gone. I can kind of hold them in my head. But then if you take music like say Ravel's Bolero or in the Hall of the Mountain King or Thus Spoke, mm. Thus Spoke Zarathustra or Tubular Bells by Mike Oldfield or Fanfare for the Common Man or Comfortably Numb by Pink Floyd, those are, and I'm just a guy. Those are songs, those are, that's music that just sticks in my head. I can't not have it in my head. What's the it's, difference between those? It's because it's about the emotions. Music is often said is a language of emotions. Um, the same emotions you have in everyday life, like, like happiness or sadness, nostalgia or anger or fear. Music is a distillation of emotions. And we aren't the only musical culture to understand that in, in, in Hindustani or Indian aesthetics. They have um, a concept called rasa and also a, of bhava. Bhava is everyday emotions. And they think that what music does, it distills bhava into rasa in the same way you distill wine from grape juice or the perfume of a flower from the, the petals. It's still the same emotional, the same uh, flavor, but it's highly concentrated. And this is what music does. And emotion is much more memorable than concepts. Think back to what, what affects you in your life. It's how you feel, it's your emotions. And you never forget those. They, they, they imprint themselves on you. And music has the same channel as, as the emotions. It drives the same channel. Well, one of the things it does, well, I don't know, maybe other things do this too. I haven't thought about it. But it's almost like synesthesia in the sense that hmm. you can listen to music and you can see color. That doesn't make any sense. Unless, I mean, does this reside in the amygdala and the limbic system? Does it reside in the hippocampus within, which then mediates it to the cerebral cortex? I don't understand, you know, again, I, here's the interesting thing about this book too. I didn't realize it, but somehow it reads like a novel, but it's Does not it? a novel. Tell and me more, why do you think that? Because, well, first of all, you make the reader work, like in a mystery or a thriller or a, uh, an intellectual piece of literature, say Dostoevsky, and you make the reader think that's one thing. And yet you tell a story too. And it has a kind of, not curve, I've forgotten the word. Arc? Um, uh, arc? Arc, yes, arc. Or a catenary. Um, yeah, it has an arc to it. And it's almost a beginning, middle and end. And that was unexpected as well. And I thought at first I thought, oh, this is going to be a difficult read. Do I really want to do this? And then it wasn't, it was accessible. And you know what I mean? It was like, you couldn't put it down kind of book. And I didn't expect that oh, at all. That's very kind of you to say so, thank you. It means You're a welcome. lot to me. Um, I wanted it to be a piece of writing. First and foremost, it's writing and then uh, communicative after that. So, so yes, and I, I told a story and the story starts with a challenge like, you know, or a problem is that music seems to, uh, to have a tragedy it seemed to be tragic because of this loss we're all born musical and then we become listeners in the west and we've, we lose this innate um gift and then i flip it i said well actually if you think harder about how we use music in the west we do make music uh, work hard we soundtrack our lives in different ways using our earbuds and we construct our identity through music even the act of listening can be very active. You can work hard as a listener. And one of my conceits is that listening to a symphony, it's a little bit like walking through an imaginary landscape. You know, you're, following, you're following the line, you know, 
and it can take three, uh, 30 minutes or even an hour journey. And, and one of my crazy, it's almost like fiction because you can't prove these, 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 these hypotheses. My craziest idea is that the musical ape and we're musical apes, we're walking, we're walking apes because four million years ago, the first hominin, the Australopithecine Ardi, got up on her, and she was a she, got up on her legs and she walked. And the rhythm of walking imprints all of musical experience, not just the physical steps of left, right, left, right, but the journey, the journey also out of Africa, right? It's the it's um, association between sound and motion, which is far from obvious because if you look at the notes uh, in the air, you can't see anything. Why does music evoke the illusion of motion, of movement? It's very strange. And my, my theory is it goes back down to, all the way back to the first, the first hominins four million years ago. And that reminds me of another reason why it reads like a novel, because it's almost like magical realism. It shouldn't be the way it is, but it is. And it's like, Two, two specific examples, and again, going back to popular culture, you talk about David Bowie's last album, when he yes. knew he was dying. Yes. And whether you look at the videos or simply listen to the music, you know what he's doing. At least I did. And the poignancy and the emotion I felt because of what he's doing. And also the idea of heroism. Mm -hmm that this is what you were doing going out. Like Queen, like Queen's last video, We Still Love You, or mm -hmm. These Are the Times of Our Lives, mm -hmm. is what it was called. Those types of things, again, go to that same kind of concept. Why am I able to understand completely what it is that he's doing? Just me, why am I able to understand that? Mm -hmm. I, th I think that what um... Bowie epitomizes is the, her, her, the heroism of what I call a late style. Late style is what great artists, including Shakespeare and, and the painters, you know, Michelangelo and Beethoven and aging pop stars, including um, Bob Dylan. Um, what happens to the aging voice or the aging artist um, is a, it's a disability culture. And one of the, you know, ennobling things about the West is that we valorize surprisingly disability culture because what is an aging human but a disabled person and so often we denigrate disability you know there's a culture of perfection in so much of Western culture but if you look very carefully our greatest artists are aging ones and there's a heroism in fighting that and conquering time if you like yeah it's like in one of the conceits in a novel when a, a man is described as a ruin, but a beautiful ruin, or whether yes. it's even the Parthenon. And you know the history of this genius, which yes. still exists, but is crumbling. Yes. Which is a bad word to use, but it is crumbling. But, like, there, like, but there's, there's still something left. And the distillation of what's left is where we both find the heroism, I believe. Yes. And, and the West as a whole is like that, we're crumbling. And there's a sort of a, um, a, beauty, a, a beauty about that. <laughs> yeah, we've had a pretty good run, but <laughs> you're 100% you're right. Although I don't know if everyone would agree with us. But <laughs> oh, because you're off of Penny Lane, I started thinking about the Beatles. And then I went, you know, I go down the rabbit hole and I went to YouTube and looked at everything. And there's this big argument about whether the Beatles understood music theory or not. And it goes to notation and G7 and Paul hitting a lower bass note and, and creating something that wasn't expected. And so, but, the, but some make these comments saying, no, they didn't know anything about music theory. And then other experts say, yes, of course they did. And they use notation to describe that. So there's an interesting yeah. point of view that we can discuss. Yeah, yeah. Um I have a friend called John Kovac, who's a very famous professor of music theory at um, Michigan. I think he's emeritus now, but he's arguably the, the greatest authority on the Beatles across the whole planet. But um, so he's analysed um, all the Beatles songs, analysed as in seeing how they work as structures in the same way we'd analyse a Schubert song. 
and Kovacs's PhD was on Schubert's song. And he sees no difference between the intricacy and the and the sophistication of a of a of a um, McCartney and Lennon song to a, to a Schubert song. Did they understand music theory? I think it's not relevant. Um, right. They ensured they learned their craft in Hamburg. You know, the re re repetition of playing in public, crafting it, crafting it, using their ears. Um, you don't need music theory to do that. It's it's learning in public. But but that said, they slightly milk it. So, for instance, McCartney was a choir boy in Liverpool, and he was exposed to the great Anglican choral tradition. And so there are quotations from Anglican, from English composers like John Ireland, who was a famous 20th century choral composer. And you can see bits of Ireland cropping up in the Emma McCartney song. But it suited Epstein to tone down, you know, the, the depth they had to, to West, to West, to, to classical music because of it, it sells better, I think, to, to present them as completely ingenue, completely self-taught natural musicians. Yeah, was, there was one story about them taking two buses across Liverpool to meet some guy who knew who knew how to play a G seven, <laughs> <laughs> and then you know again going even deeper down and well, it's not really popular music, but you do talk about things like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star or Rockabye Baby or Row 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 Your Boat. Yes. And why do these every child, every infant naturally I don't know if the word is love, but gravitates towards these songs and they make a big difference in their lives. And why they, they do in the West. In, in the West, we, we teach our children to like certain sounds, uh, our, a, major, a major third or a triad or, or, or consonant harmonies and very simple rhythms. If you look to across the world to Bali, like in Bali, they enjoy very different kinds of sounds, which to, to our ears sound horrible or discordant, like a an out of tune minor minor ninth, right? Because for them, it creates a, a buzz or a spice. What is a spice to them is to us noise. So it's a value judgment. But roughly every child's born with the same uh, propensity for a very wide range of sounds. And then what happens, every culture starts to, to winnow, to filter, to reduce that range into a much narrower range, which, bef which befits that particular culture. Why Twinkle Twinkle? Um, there's something archetypal about it. Um, even Mozart, you and Mozart based a piece around Twinkle Twinkle. It's a perfect, I can't sing very well, but- I'm just, I'm just singing in my you, head. You go, you go up and then you go down and that perfect arc of going up and down um, kind of epitomizes the dynamic of all music in, in the West. Well, yeah. I that three, three blind mice or happy birthday to you. <laughs> yeah, the most played song in the history. It's a cartoon. These are cartoons. They're little tiny gem-like distillations of the whole principle. And then when you're talking about what may be cacophonous to one and not to the other, there, you know, when I first heard Ravi Shankar and I saw the woman in the back playing the drone, I was wondering, why is she necessary? It's just like the drone. And then I didn't understand it. I, I still don't understand that. Explain that to me. It's not necessary. It's just nice. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the, we assume the sitar, which is what he plays, is um, archetypal of Indian Hindustani music. But it was, it was only imported in the 16th century, right? If you go right back to the Vedic hymns, more you know, more than 2,000 years ago, Indian culture didn't have that. And similarly, if you cross south to the Carnatic tradition of South India, um, that there's, they see themselves as, as older and more traditional. If you go north of Pakistan to Kawali music, which is a lot more dramatic, Kawali has a harmonium, like a little organ, which would have been anathema a thousand years ago. But now um, it's unthinkable to hear um, Nusrat Ali Khan, a, a famous um, come on a singer without the harmonium drone in the background. Uh, things are introduced because of fashion, because they, they sound nice, and they become enshrined in a new tra an evolving tradition. Traditions are invented, they're not, uh, they're, they're, they're not um, um, pristine. And the further back you go in time, the more things are different. That's true. 
I remember George Harrison saying, I've learned how to play the sitar in six weeks. And Ravi Shankar responded, I've been playing it all my life and I still don't know how to play it. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, that was great. Um, what else was I gonna ask you about? Oh, when you talked about, when we talked about the difference in between perception in one culture and another, but what about Stravinsky's Rite of Spring and everybody going crazy and leaving the theater and going berserk? How did, what, why is that? What happened? What happened that we don't understand today? Because now it seems it's fine. Well, uh, um, all the great composers, um, if they're great, of offend their audiences. It's a bit like being a teacher or, or a professor and we get these course evaluation questionnaires, you get them in the States. And yeah. generally, if students don't like you, that's probably probably a good thing because you're, you're stretching them, <laughs> you know. And who's to judge? Because why should a student judge a professor when, when you think about it? And uh, b before Beethoven's time, he was beholden upon the composer to please and to be understood. But then Be Beethoven flips that. And after Beethoven, it's the job of the audience to catch up with the genius. And Stravinsky then uh, exacerbates that. He's writing completely futuristic, mind-blowing stuff. And he wasn't expecting um, audiences in that time to understand him. Now we do, but we have to play catch up with him. Yeah, I remember a comedian who said things that were totally off the wall. And one woman said, you know, I'm so offended by what you're doing. And he said, <laughs> you may be offended, but I don't find myself offensive. <laughs> and it's very true and yeah well and that's what's so difficult about cancel culture now in the states yeah. is whether you yeah. cancel dr seuss or whether yeah. you cancel tom sawyer or huckleberry finn you're getting rid of a lot of things that have a great deal of value I it's a very... sorry i was wondering whether that ha actually happens in music whether it's canceled <laughs> Well, as you may know, there are attempts to cancel Beethoven, to cancel um, so-called, you know, well, um, great white German dead music um, because of its association with um, white supremacy and colonialism and slavery. And the this patriarchy. Is a, this is a very, very hot potato in the UK as well. And uh, only this week, um, what, what's been making news is that Oxford University, you know, is talking about cancelling its its classical curriculum and throwing open the curriculum to well, to everything. Um, so it's a very live debate, and it's very easy to get burnt if you engage with this debate. All, all I would say, given that I'm on YouTube, is that um, <laughs> that's true. You, 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 you can't cancel history. What you need to do is to understand and reflect upon history. Well, it's, yeah, it's like in America, not taking down yeah. these statues of people that are now found yeah. to be offensive. I find that it's better to leave these things up so we can remember, even if it was wrong, what we were. Otherwise, what did you say in your book? History is just one thing after another or something like that? What, one damned thing after another. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly, exactly right. Or as Henry Ford said, history is bunk. Um, <laughs> and the other thing I found that I thought about when I was reading this as a novel was, so no one dances or yells at a symphony or straddles someone's shoulders and gets up on top and yells and screams. You wear a suit. You're very careful not to applaud between movements yes. or you become a pariah. Yes. It's a completely different manner in which you listen it is it is it's not the way this, this so when we go to a concert hall you you're told to, to sit stock still and you can't move you can't even tap or sway and it's quite asphyxiating i find but if you look at the other great art traditions like uh, the critties uh, in carnatic music in south india when um the audience is listening to a critty by chaga raja who was a great uh, 18th century Indian composer, they're expected to clap or to tap or to make gestures or even to count in time with the music. And this way they felt to be participating in it. It's a way of, an, you know, accommodating the audience. Um, there's something, you know, quite unnatural in the West about this 
a etiquette of sitting stock still in a concert, which is why I don't like I don't like concerts. I prefer to you know to be don to be bopping to Beethoven in my front room at home. <laughs> That's so funny. The the one funny story I do have is my daughter who loves music, but doesn't play an instrument. And we were, she was like three years old and we were at a symphony, I think it was Schubert. And we were in the second tier, the second balcony on the rail. And somewhere right in the middle of the symphony, she began to conduct it. Yeah. And she yeah. conducted it in a beautiful way, but it yeah. was, it became irritating to the conductor because he happened to look up and see her doing it. And he yeah. kind of lost his own rhythm. And then afterwards, all these women and men came up to my daughter saying, what instrument do you play? That was lovely what you were doing. And I, I had to say, well, she doesn't really play any instrument, but it shocked, again, and it, I was very proud of her, but it also shocked me. But it, for her, it just seemed the most natural thing. Yeah. One of my discoveries in my deep dive through history was that um, in ancient Egypt, and also King David, when he invents the Psalms, they all assume that music comes out of the dancing body. The dancing body of the god Merit for the Egyptians, but with King David, he dances the psalms through his fingers or the hands, what's called the hands of David. And these finger gestures were, were written down in the, in, the, in the psalmic diacritic notation. And we all have this almost this natural urge to dance to music because there's an affinity between the dancing body and how music works. Um, that famous Mr. Bean. Do you get Mr. Bean in the States? Um, yeah. Mr. Bean is is conducting a brass band concert of um, Christmas Christmas carols, and as he changes his beat, the music's also changing, which can't happen, of course. But and it's the illusion we all have when we're at a symphony, we're watching a great conductor like Bernstein. The illusion is that the music is flowing from their fingers into the into the orchestra. Of course, it's not happening because he's just directing them, but there is a, a mass illusion going on that the music flows from the body. And yeah. it's, an, it's an ancient illusion too, and we all have it. We still have it. And most Americans don't understand, and I must confess to a certain extent I don't either, what the conductor is doing and what the orchestra is doing responding to him, especially yes. when they're not looking at him, yes. or it seems as if they're not looking at him. Yeah. And it, Go ahead. No, no, it's it's a necessary focus. If the conductor wasn't there, you'd miss them, because it's a focus. If you're looking at the stage, you need that body, that moving body, to channel the music, to 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 symbolize, to to incarnate it, to symbolize it. It is, you know, I would say based on reading your book and my own, and bringing to the surface my own feelings and thoughts that. Bottom line is music is magical. It's magic. It is. And I can tell you after more than 30, 40 years of thinking hard about music, I don't understand it. I haven't even, I haven't even scraped the surface of this magical phenomenon. Like Ravi Shankar. <laughs> I really don't, don't know what's going on. And, my, and what knowledge I do have just gets in the way. If I'm listening to something, I said, go away, knowledge. I switch off my brain and just, just experience it. Well, yeah, I know it's like Einstein talking about genius. Genius is knowing that you don't know anything about something. And uh, yeah, it's, it's very true. And that's why it's so difficult. And that's again, why I like the novel because generally it's so difficult to understand the concept like this. Well, I'm diff I have difficulty with math and generally because of the notation. And it's really, there's a new book called Math Without Numbers that I just interviewed the guy and it's very similar to yours because he never uses a formula in the book. No formulas, no numbers. He just talks. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's the same thing. It gives you access to something that you would otherwise not have a way in. You know, it's like um, opening a door that otherwise wouldn't have opened. Or um, like seeing through a, deck, a, a glass darkly and then someone takes a little rag and all of a sudden you see through to it. So that was, that was, I'm not, I'm not trying, I'm not attempting to compliment or be sycophantic, but that's no. what the book did for me. Yeah. I think that my motivation is like when I'm, when I'm cooking for friends or families to share love, you know, love of pleasure, love, love of cooking, love of music. I want to share it. And for so long, people have been put off by the 
you know how technical music seems to be it's, it's people are terrified of music because it seems on musicology i should say because it seems to be so technical and music notation and it, it's tragic you know it stopped people like me communicating our, our love to a wider audience well that okay well then let's look back to what you earlier alluded to the rustling of trees or humpback whales or mm. I don't know, buzzing of bees, but it's more like the rustling of trees analogy. Is is the rustling of trees music? Well, I say in is it chapter chapter eleven or chapter ten? I think um, I talk about pink noise. Do you remember that? <laughs> the music mm -hmm. was a pink noise. Um, noise isn't all noisy or isn't all the same. So white noise is 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 ugly. It's an ugly hiss of, of TV static. Pink noise is natural. You, you hear pink noise in the rustling of trees or water. To do with um, the, the sp I won't go into it now, but the acoustics of 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 the octaves. Basically, with pink noise, it's much more. It's much deeper. There's a sort of drone going on. In white noise, it's all even. It's all e uh, uh, equally spread. But the way that um, in pink noise, um, the ratios of the acoustics repeat. Um, through the octaves is what happens in music. Music has this balance between being too boring, like a sine wave, or too complex, like chaos or Brownian motion. It hits the Goldilocks sweet spot um, and is fractal. I talk about fractals in the penultimate chapter. The universe is fractal because um, a, gal a galaxy has the same appearance as the human eye, a cell in the human eye. And if you look at a, a spectrograph, an acoustic spectrograph, you can focus in recursively and it all looks the same in music. Clouds look the same whether you're focusing on the entire cloud or a tiny bit of cloud. And music is an art of repetition. You know, you, you repeat beats, you repeat bars, you repeat phrases, you repeat movements, you repeat the symphony. It's repeat after repeat at rising levels. And it's the medium which of repetition which we enjoy. It's it's like the language of the universe, and we hear it in the pink noise of nature, in the rustling of trees and the rippling of water. I know. I think it's, it's where we, yeah. It's just remembering the concept of the music of the spheres. We don't hear the music of the spheres, but it seems as if there is that. And we, also, we, yeah, if yes. you're talking about the Mandelbrot set or fractals. My brothers and I are in the building business, and we've never built one building without a water feature. Even my bookstore has a water feature. And when you were talking about the chaotic or the Brownian motion or fractalization, I realized, is, is the water from my fountain, I listen to it every day, but I don't hear it. I don't know if I hear it anymore, but I listen to it. I may not hear it, but I listen to it. And uh, so, yes, it's like watching a fire in a fireplace yes exactly exactly and, uh, yeah i live in a house for you wouldn't be old but it's 1775 so when i look into the fireplace i realize there's generation upon generation beneath me doing exactly the same thing and so with water whether you're listening to a stream or the ocean or my fountain why is that not chaos why is it randomness that's not randomness either what is it it's um, always the same, but always different. <laughs> it's fascinating in this way. It's always the same, but it's always endlessly different. And music, music is like that. So it's like it's, not stepping in the same river twice. Yeah. Um, I talk at the, the end of one of the chapters about um, uh, Takemitsu, the famous Japanese composer. And Takemitsu is talking about a, um, um, a flute lesson he had with a Shakuhachi master. Shakuhachi is a bamboo flute. And whilst he's uh, listening to the Shakuhachi master play, there's a hot pot bubbling in the background. And uh, Takemitsu says, Master, I couldn't tell the difference between your playing of the flute, the Shakuhachi, and the hot pot bubbling. And the master says, you have heard it correctly. Because in Japan, they don't differentiate between the sounds of nature and the sounds of art, the sounds of music, which we do in the West. One of our great failings is that we abstract ourselves from nature. 
no, no, never more so than when we abstract what we call a note from a sound. No, notes aren't sounds for us, but they are for most of the rest of the world. I know. I was thinking of uh, pictures, paintings of Mount Fuji, and there's always a, a person in there, but he's a little tiny. And then yeah. when you yes. went off, when you went off on Kurosawa, I'm thinking to myself, why is he? What does Kurosawa <laughs> have to do with any of this? And then I listened and watched, and I realized, yeah, it's very yeah. Explain explain that. I can't explain it. You need to explain it. Um, but Kurosawa's um, greatest film for me was Ran, based on King Lear, and it's the heartbreaking ending of Ran, where the blind beggar, who's the last survivor of this carnage is finding his way on the edge of a cliff with his walking stick and you think well, is he going to tumble over the edge of the cliff or not and they're playing um actually a flute music by takemitsu the composer i just mentioned uh, now when i first saw ran it was many many years ago I, I knew nothing about japanese culture or takemitsu but the sadness of the flute uh was audible to me uh, uh, it transcended the language barrier the Japanese language barrier in a way which wouldn't be possible if I was trying to read a haiku in Japanese. And that's the difference between music and language. To understand the sadness, say, of the great haiku, you have to understand the Japanese language. But to get the sadness of that flute music at the end of round, you don't. It seemed, it's much more immediate. Um, so I was talking about the immediacy of, of musical emotion from that perspective. Yeah. And because you're combining the film with the sound, it's like, I was thinking about that as well. What if movies didn't have soundtrack? What if John Williams didn't have the Star Wars theme? What would, how could we watch even movies like John Wick or violent movies? How would we respond to those movies without the, and these composers are sought after because we need this person to do the soundtrack. Yeah. Otherwise the movie's just not going to work. And I wondered about that as well. And I thought that was a good question now because we were talking about a movie and a song that's associated with the, the heartbreak of the film. But can you imagine Spielberg's Jaws soundtrack by Buster Keaton? You know, it wouldn't it wouldn't be the same film, would it? <laughs> yeah, it put the fear of God into millions of people. It was the music, music more than the shark coming out of the water. Yeah, I, you knew yeah, something well, bad was coming, and there goes the magic again. Why is something bad coming? Because someone's playing an instrument. Yeah, we un underestimate the colossal input that f film scores have into the film experience. Why? And I talk about this um, in the chapter about um, the evolution of sapiens from hominins. That before we had language, so one and a half million years ago, there was no language. People communicated. A bit like Tom and Jerry do in the Fred Quimby cartoons. Um, yeah, the orchestra, the orchestra is saying a lot. All those gestures, these are animals talking to each other through gesture, and don't you need a single word to know what's what's going on? And that is where language came from. And film music today picks up on that. It's still doing the same job. It's nonverbal communication. It's like those old Looney Tune movies with all the animals in the middle of the woods and they don't say anything, but there's this lovely soundtrack and they actually have the instruments and they're playing them. Well, we overestimate language. How much, how much is really going on? Do, do you need words to communicate? No. You use expressions, gestures, just touching, just being with someone. Well, you know, there's a Tom and Jerry new movie out. Now I'm gonna have to watch it and listen to the soundtrack. Yeah. I just, because my daughter just told me she saw it. And when you're talking about um, evolutionary matters and the beginning of humankind, I thought back to something I've always thought about all my life is, um, but it's gone, is ontogeny recapitulating phylogeny and how yeah. Haeckel was scorned and the idea was dismissed, but you kind of resurrected to a certain extent in your book. I, I did, and I expect to be shot down by the, um, the scientists for that. So. Haeckel <laughs> was this actually quite quite a renowned scientist in the late 19th century, but um, his very discredited theory of recapitulation. So, as an embryo develops um, in the womb, it repeats or recapitulates the stages of of, of evolution in the past, uh, and no one believes that anymore. 
However, if you look at the human brain and emotion, it's certainly going on. So a baby um, is only capable of understanding very basic primitive emotions like anger and fear. And as the baby grows up and becomes more sophisticated, it understands social emotions like shame or jealousy and eventually pride or, or hope. Um, and that is recapitulating um, the evolution of emotions in animals. So um, reptiles have very basic emotions, mammals have a much more diverse suite of emotions. Mammals can understand. If, you have a, if you're a dog lover, right? Um, dogs teach you about the primary colours of emotions. When a joy is happy to see you or is whining because it misses you, or is barking with rage. It's not that similar. Darwin, it's not that different from human emotions. And Charles Darwin taught me that. Darwin's great book on the expression of emotions in man and animals. Um, he argues for a continuity between human emotions and, and animal emotions. And although human music is nothing like dog music, under the surface, um, is based on the same suite of emotions. We are animals. Well, then, is that similar to the idea that a newborn baby is very pleased and happy by the sound, its sounds its mother's making, but the sounds its mother's making are cooing sounds and yes. nonsense sounds and melodic yes. sounds. So yeah. where is the mother? I understand kind of understand now about the baby but where is the mother where how is that so innate in her i don't what think it's necessarily about? that the sounds themselves it's the relationship between the two and the sight it's the bonding it's sight it's smiling a lot and nodding the kind of games they play where each 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 partner seeks to anticipate or to surprise the other um but mother ease, as it's called, or infant directed learning, um, primatologists think it was pretty similar to the kind of proto language or proto discourse, which would have been uh, uh, spoken, I suppose, um, a million years ago. And in, in this respect, mother ease is recapitulating in Haeckel's term, proto language a million years ago. Yeah, the thing about Haeckel is I, I always liked it because I figure if we had gills and a tail, <laughs> pretty obvious. But that's just the way I thought. You know? Well, I, now you mention fish. Um, I also <laughs> mention. I also say that there's a reason why we talk about music touching us. This haptic um, figure of speech that we're touched or or we swim, we're immersed in music. It's like a, a species memory of when we were fish, when we. So fish detects sound through its lateral line. It doesn't hear, it senses sound, the, the motions of other fish, the vibrations. And the lateral line became our um, organ of corti in our cochlea, eventually. And we've kept that very, very distant memory of when we were in the water, um, sound enveloped us and touched us. And music is a liquid. We, we swim through music in the same way. It's similar to, I was thinking about the mother and the baby where the mother hides her eyes and then goes peekaboo and the yes. baby laughs. And I was thinking, okay, can I equate music to our sense of humor, to the concept of laughter, which is also musical. Yeah. My brother has a musical laugh. Yes, yes. I'm sure Mozart was extremely funny. And listen. Um, um, I mean, over, over and above the humour, there's a technique for comedy. So a great comedian, like a great composer, has this, um, a consummate sense of timing, like exactly when to drop that punchline or to, to wait or to pace it, that dramatic sense. There's a lot in common between comedians and composers. It's like that joke about Jack Benny when the, when the mugger stops him and says, your money or your life, and he pauses <laughs> until he says, I'm, I'm thinking, <laughs> <laughs> but it has to have the right timing. Yes, exactly. You couldn't respond quickly. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay. With that, I think we've covered a great deal of the book. I could go on for hours, 
but have. thanks so much, Michael. Um, remember everyone to come to the bookstore in April. It's the musical human, a history of life on earth. And even if you think that it's too hard for you to read, it's not, it's accessible, it's fun, and you'll learn a great deal. So thanks so much, Michael, for joining us today. Thank you, Sam, for having me. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. So long. Thank you.